welcome everyone. Welcome, 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 welcome. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Alicia Carey, Chief Executive of Hawkwood's Centre for Future Thinking, and I'd like to extend my warmest of welcomes to our extraordinary Stroud community that is joining us here today to honour the work of our dear friend, Polly Higgins. This event is part of the Fintorn Climate Change and Consciousness Conference, which we have been live streaming at Hawkwood all week. Before Polly passed away on Sunday, it was her express wish that this event should carry on so we can come together and continue her important work. Polly has not only been a personal friend, but also a dear friend to Hawkwood since she came to our first seed festival in 2013 and has been involved in our work ever since. Her grace, style, mischievousness and all her absolute constant passion that she shared with us all was a force to behold. And she has touched countless people around the globe. She literally worked tirelessly to make positive change to protect the planet. So I'd like to thank Findhorn for creating an exceptional event. My colleague Katie Lloyd Nunn, who has been holding the Hawkwood Livestream Hub here all week at Hawkwood. And for Lush, thank you for coming to help us today and for filming this event. Now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Gail Bradbrook, co-founder of XR, and who will be followed by Jojo Mehta, leader of Stop Ecocide, Change the Law. And we are all speaking today on behalf of Polly Higgins. Thank you. I'm not sure I could be full of a more turbulent amount of emotion this morning, if I'm honest. What a week or oh, two weeks we've had with Extinction Rebellion and in the middle of it to hear of our dear sister Polly passing away. Um, I just need to let you know as well, it's, I have a minor operation just after 11 today. It's no big deal, but I have to go quickly. So I'll be sad to leave you all. Uh, in 2014, my friend Joe Robbins, who I think is here, went to uh, Schumacher College to be with Charles Eisenstein and Polly Higgins, and she came back absolutely buzzing. Um, that should be a lot better. Sorry. <laughs> Shall I start again? <laughs> okay. So in 2014, my friend uh, Joe Robbins went to Schumacher College. Do you know, I'm just aware of something. Polly used to tell me to not say um. <laughs> but I also noticed she always used to say I. You do the Scottish I. And like, I was like, you do that I thing, Polly. She's like, oh, it doesn't count. <laughs> but, okay. um, <laughs> so I might I. I might not. I might I'll probably um. It's a bit Yorkshire. So, yeah, Joe went to meet uh, with... Charles Eisenstein and Polly and just came back absolutely buzzing and full of life and thoughts about how we do change. And then Polly and Ian moved to Stroud and I very nervously felt that I needed to meet this amazing woman and felt very shy and wondered if it would actually happen and how to make it happen. And, you know, I just went to Star and East and there she was. <laughs> As if by magic. <laughs> It was very natural, and I said hello, and that I wanted to start mass civil disobedience, a great way to start a conversation. <laughs> and she, you know what, she was perfect. Because I can tell you, actually, as a working class woman, my dad was a coal miner, I've told so many people since 2010 that I believe what's absolutely necessary is mass civil disobedience. And I've been met, if I'm honest, by much discouragement and, and, and being dismissed and, and, and not really being heard. And it's OK, you know, I'm, it's fine, because I'm a Torian. <laughs> and I just pick myself up and carry on. And Polly was absolutely instrumental in giving me what I needed 
which was two things, well, three things actually, friendship. And, but in particular, really deep encouragement. She absolutely believed in me instantly. She said, that's an amazing idea. And she encouraged everybody she met. She had written a book called Dare to be Great, and she just believed in everybody's potential to, to lead and to do what these times require of us. And the second thing she did was that she introduced me to a, a person who was heading up a, a chambers, a barrister. You can maybe guess who, uh, but I respect some privacy. And that person corrected the error of a, a solicitor who'd given me some legal advice, who'd said that I was risking conspiracy charges and that conspiracy charges had maximum life imprisonment. So I was basically crapping myself constantly trying to organise massive disobedience and thinking I was about to get sent down forever. So I used to run off and put letters in the post to people. And um, <laughs> this person told me, sure, but conspiring to do what? Change the world. And actually, you know, you probably get six months re re reduced to three. So suddenly... <laughs> Suddenly, I felt absolutely liberated to uh, really push in a much more open way for what I was trying to do. So there's been a journey. I helped set up Compassionate Revolution with Barity and Dinesh and others who are here. And one of the first things that Dinesh uh, and I did together was to uh, start... I, sorry, start a mass meditation for ecocide law. So we talked about Compassionate Revolution as being... Uh, mass acts of art, heart and civil disobedience. So that was a heart piece. And then Compassionate Revolution, after I met Roger Hallam, became uh, called Rising Up. And we, as part of that, did some anti-fracking protests. So a lot of this journey is what you do on the outer and also what you did do on the inner. And in this room, you know, I, I needed to move forwards in my life. And it was like I had one foot on the bank and another in a boat and was struggling to make that move. There was a, a, an important moment happened in this room when Polly and um, a woman who dances in change worked together and we did a piece of alchemy in this room, which was a key part of my journey. Polly said that sometimes to make a law, you have to break a law. And I think sometimes you have to break a window even as part of that. And, <laughs> Simon, uh, who's my boyfriend and also a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, which was a campaign that started from rising up, but obviously it's got its own feet now, was especially focused on bringing campaigns together, the campaigns that we were doing in Rising Up and the campaign around ecocide, bringing it together on a legal footing. And he worked with uh, Polly and her team on the Earth Protectors, on the Conscientious Protector Defence, so that's been a key part of what we've done in Rising Up. So January last year, with support from Polly, we created a dossier of harm caused by fracking. Uh, three of us from, four of us from Stroud had put ourselves in arm tubes in, in Preston New Road in front of the fracking site as part of a role in resistance. And myself, Poeng, who, and Josiette, who's here today, were in court last January and we were one of the first people to run the conscientious protector's defence. We were found guilty and we didn't expect anything otherwise. But we all learned through the process uh, things like it's probably helpful to self-represent. Some barristers are a little bit timid. And, um, <laughs> do you know, there's, there's, there's some... I'll come on to that. There's something here about when you really don't give a shit anymore. Um, I mean, in a good way, when your heart and your will are like that. And so the next defence that's been thought of that aligns with conscientious protectors, and I know Polly's done a piece of work on this, are crimes against humanity, looking at that as a defence. And after January, we were welcomed back by Polly's team and supported uh, with our crowdfunder, we had our fines paid off after 48 hours, which was a relief to not have that financial burden. <laughs> so it's about £1,000 between the three of us. So Extinction Rebellion was discussed last year and agreed in my house in Stroud uh, in April. 
and we launched it on October the 31st. Greta Thunberg from the Swedish school striker came to support our launch and we did a period of rebellion in November. There were actions at Downing Street, at DEFRA, at the Department for Business, Energy, Industrial Strategy, which was anti-fracking. And there were many arrests. Uh, including myself and Simon, but they seem to have, we, and we would be running the defences, but they've actually keep dropping the cases. So we've had over a thousand people arrested this, this period of rebellion, uh, which is phenomenal. And so we're waiting for some of us not to have cases dropped. <laughs> <laughs> And that's probably going to be the Shell action. So all honour to the people here that took part in the action of Shell. It was very much done in honour of Polly and her work. And for anybody who has any doubt, Polly was very much behind the smashing of the window. <laughs> I know that can feel like an act of violence. But in all honesty, when something is done with love and care and with responsibility, and when you stay and, you, and you're willing to take the punishment, that is not an act of violence, that's an act of deep love. And it's also very tactical, because by doing more than £6,000 worth of damage, that case, when it gets heard, should be heard in a Crown Court with a jury service. Uh, with the jury uh, present, which is much more... I'm, I'm feeling like I, uh, there's a, probably a lawyer here could correct me on any of this information here, but um, the, the point being that we're always we're pushing an edge, and what I'm obviously trying to say to you today is that the Extinction Rebellion and Polly's work are very intimately linked spiritually, emotionally, in friendship, in love, in solidarity, and also very practically. So the Extinction Reba Rebellion, along with the school strikes, has changed the landscape in terms of the discussion about the environment. <laughs> Every time that we've done something, it's gone much better than I expected, and it's because I live in a community, I think, where it, it supported this idea that we can pray for what we really want and to really call in for that. And I know with Polly behind the scenes in that way, we've got a great ally there always. And also the determination of the people that have organised that, right? I mean, there's an incredible team of people uh, in London, mostly, but not just, and also across the country. It's a social movement. It's so much bigger than any of, the, any of us. So I maybe repeat what I said the other day in, in Marble Arch, was don't make any of us special. I don't want to be on uh, some pedestal and separated from anybody. I'm a dickhead a lot of the time. Don't do that to me. Just keep me checked in. Look after us all and um, uh, honour all of our jobs in this, in this process. And actually, Fiona there has taken up the business uh, sector, which is awesome and also is getting a bit of a backlash already because what our job at the minute to, is to do is to pull people together you know, people who are traditionally think of themselves as anarchists, who are more Green Party scientists, more left-wing um, intersectionalists, if that means anything to you. There's just different people that care, and our job is to weave them together, and it takes a lot of heart and a lot of courage. And that's something that you can really learn from Polly about. So meetings with government are being arranged. I'm not sure that I'm supposed to tell you that, but I just did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not personally expecting them to be the end point <laughs> of this piece because what this is about is about letting go of a system that we're all embedded in. And as I've been saying, you know, the act of civil disobedience and supporting civil disobedience for those of whom it's not the right thing is, is an act of initiation. It's an act of shedding the system as it, as it stands. And we've had enough of it, right? And it's not anybody's fault in that way. It's, it's all of our responsibilities. So I think the next phase is going to be about more movement building, more actions. In, in my personal opinion, it's also going to be about the finance system. And it's incredible to hear the CBI say we're right. It's incredible that Mark Carney is making statements like he is. But that sector is, is at the heart of of how this system operates. And I, uh, as I always felt, that the mass civil disobedience is going to need to be 
related to financial things. I think it's going to be about us refusing to pay our debts off personally. Sorry. But I, let's wow. see. Um, and building an alternative financial system. But obviously, that, that needs to be a, a group decision in Extinction Rebellion. Mm. So we need to do things from this place of love, of positivity, of healthy use of language. That's something I very much learned from Polly, and I hope she'll be there checking me when we start talking about fighting and winning and battling and war and... No, it's protection and love. And, but it has that spirit in it. It doesn't make it soft. It doesn't make it soft. Only soft when it's needed. This time is a time that I think we've all been waiting for. It is about the shifting consciousness. It's the coming together. It's a birthing. I, that, one of the amazing things that happened, there were many, was to go to the pink boat. I saw somebody here with a pink boat. Yeah, We put a big pink vagina in the middle of Oxford Circus. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> And I went, I went there, and, and who should happen to be there but uh, Claire and Marc Dubois from Tree Sisters, which was lovely, really lovely to see them, and they brought a woman from the Amazon to speak to us all. And one of the things she said is, if you're alive today, it's because you have a job to do. So just really calling us all to be that part of ourselves that's been waiting to do this work and waiting to do it together. And we have to be on our inner work, you know, the place where we get separated and, uh, and all that. We need to do, carry on doing that work. We have so many tools, so many tools. And I tell you what's beautiful to see is the young people, because those of us in my generation, and we've been in Hawkwood and other places doing our work and trying out ways of processing and healing ourselves. And God, it's been hard bloody work at times, right, hasn't it? It's been like walking through treacle. You see these young people, and they are... Of course, they still have work to do, but they are so much more aligned. Mm -hmm. The XR youth, they are gorgeous. I keep wanting to join them in meetings. I keep like... <laughs> like oh, I'm 30 years too late, Gail. They are... Um, they are diverse as well. They're not a sea of white faces. They are uh, together and they are determined. And frankly, they've literally got nothing to lose. So um, God bless uh, uh, Stroud Leisure Centre because Fiona, Ellis and I bumped into each. Nothing's by accident, is it, really? Come on. And uh, she mentioned her son to me and I... Um, you didn't actually send me his contacts by email, and I just had such a, a, a thing to, I, I must look this guy up. So he's leading XR Youth. So there's such a connection with Stroud in Extinction Rebellion. And it's not just, right? I mean, it's, it, there's also, you know, Rogers from West Wales. There's Ian Bray up in Huddersfield. All, lots of different people, Claire Farrell in London. So Stroud's got a lot to do with it and, and more. Polly was... Um, is, in my view, a, what you'd call a bodhisattva, a great soul, who'd come to this uh, place to do some work with us all. And I had the deep honour of sitting in a full-on ceremony with her one time, which involved vomiting and all sorts. <laughs> it was really full-on. And... Um, so, as well as being that raging soul, I've also seen her as this really fucking hard Scottish lass <laughs> who could knock back her medicine like a whiskey. I mean, if she needed to do something, she was a warrior as well. So I just wanted to honour her warrior spirit. I've all seen Jojo for so long as her right-hand woman. And also, you know... Polly has a phenomenal team we all need to get behind, but I particularly want to speak about Jojo. They were so and are so aligned that Jojo and Polly would make decisions on behalf of each other. They would do their sort of internal muscle testing, connecting to a deep intuition and the connection between each other. And I'm absolutely sure, 100%, that that peace will remain. And in that way, Jojo will not only have a, her own wisdom, but will be carrying Polly's wisdom with her. Um, Jojo and I have done work together at the, around the incinerator, and that's something we all need to take on, right? I mean, we're not letting that thing fire up, are we? Um, <laughs> has been a thing 
trying to encourage civil disobedience. I did say recently in an interview, it's been when you talk to people about it and you talk to them about the possibility that they might break the law, it's like you've just asked them to sort of strip off and have a poo in the corner or something. <laughs> That's what it was like a few months ago, but not now. I mean, people are just like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Uh, and again, no pressure on anybody. Everybody has a different role in this piece. But um, Jojo and I... Uh, have done some cheeky things at the incinerator, right? And uh, I just so admire your ability to get shit done. I want, we, we sort of talked about this occupation and I get a little bit, oh, project manager heads, it's all, oh, so just suddenly it's happening. It's just happening. Incredible <laughs> energy and a phenomenal mind. And so I'm asking us all, and I really actually feel this, I'm speaking on behalf of Polly here, to get behind her team and in particular, to get behind Jojo's leadership now, to lift her up in our love and in our support. So over to Jojo. wonderful <laughs> to see so many faces all of you Ian Polly's beloved husband and to see you all here this community is where Polly spent her last years and it's where she finally felt at home it's the first place she felt she had a true community around her and that community is all of you it's all of us and I think it's important to acknowledge that um, and I hope that's also visible in our film today. All of this is a download. <laughs> Polly called them her downloads. And all the key moments in her campaign over the years, both before we started working together uh, and after, I've been working with Polly quite closely for four years now. And there were key moments where she would come in in the morning, she'd go, Jojo had a download. <laughs> um, and, uh, and what she meant was that there was, you know, this higher, higher power, higher moral premise, if you like, that she embodied was kind of working through her. And these key moments always came to her, you know, almost as visions. And when she was in hospital three weeks ago, she, she, did, she said this to me again. She said, I've had a vision. She said, I realise I'm not going to make it up to Findhorn for the 25th. She said, but you know what? We're going to do it at Hawkwood. Um, and she said, I want everybody there, everybody. Um, it's going to be brilliant. Um, and she said, and it's going to look like this. And she described the hall and the foliage. And she said, and there's going to be a lovely armchair. And I'm going to sit in that armchair. As far as I'm concerned, it's exactly where she is right now. Okay, um, with, all, with all the leaves. And with Polly, it was always about wild foliage. It was never about cut flowers. She said, you know, flowers grow in the ground. You know. she's, she always, she's particularly talked about ivy and dangling ivy, and it was beautiful bamboo as well. So this was very, very much part of her vision. A little bit later, when it was clear that she was still really very weak, she said, Jojo, if I can't make it, you're doing it, but it goes ahead. And here we are. Polly was incredibly graceful about everything that happened to her. And I mean that the entire time I've known her. But it became so acutely visible in the last few weeks. It was such a fast process, what happened. Um, she had had a sort of chest infection since coming back from Mallorca in January, where she took a lovely train journey down there with her husband. Um, and it never quite went away. She came up and down a little bit, but it never quite went away. Um, and she said, there's something going on here. You know, something's going on here. There's, there's something I'm having to deal with here. Um, and she was so open and always questioning, 
always looking into herself for what might be blocking things, for what might be moving things forward or not. And we always worked in this way. It was always hugely intuitive. Um, and if we ever got kind of what felt like stuck in the work of taking ecocide law forward, we always would look to what was going on for us so that we could get past whatever it was and always that would free up the next step. Um, and so that amazing attitude, you know, took her to a clinic in Czech Republic that specialised in respiratory disorders. And our first uh, shock, if you like, was hearing that she had pneumonia and pleurisy and that there was clearly strong inflammation going on in this area. But it was only when she didn't respond as quickly to the treatment as they expected that there were further tests done. And I had a call from her saying, Jojo, they've done some tests for indicators for cancer and I'm off the scale. They want me to go home now because if I go to a hospital here, I may not get home. And so I picked her up from the airport and brought her home. And within 24 hours, she'd had a whole bunch of tests that showed how advanced the situation was. And it, it was extraordinary. Um, you know, we kind of sat there and looked at each other and went, this is nuts. What are we going to do? <laughs> you know, and right from, you know, the, the whole time, she never took it as, she was never devastated. She was never fearful. She, was, she wasn't even really upset. It was like, wow, this is the next challenge. This is what's appeared. Oh my God, that was fast. Wow, this is crazy. How are we going to deal with this? And she was always very clear that she wanted everybody to know, as soon, or, or virtually as soon as she did, what was going on. And the, the, I would say the outpouring, the inpouring from around the world of love and support was just phenomenal. It was phenomenal. And between all of that, you know, we worked out an extraordinary program for her and people to manage that program for her in terms of approaches of how to deal with where she was at because the medical... A uh, profession had basically said, we are, we're already at a stage where we can't do anything for you. Um, and so we put this incredible program together and she was absolutely um, clear and disciplined about it um, and, and deeply grateful. And I will say as well that, you know, ev ev all of your, everybody's um, suggestions and contributions were all taken into account. They were all read um, and, you know, we intuitively worked through them all and worked it worked out who we were working with and how, and, and so many of them echoed each other. So I just want to express that enormous gratitude that she had and that we had in dealing with all of that. And we do believe that during the whole time that we knew she was ill and the time that she went into hospital because she had a couple of operations, the drain fluid from her lungs, um, because she, you know, it, was, it was literally squeezing her heart. Um, and... She felt much better after that, but her heart was very weakened. And there were moments where we thought we were going to lose her, but we didn't. And we had support in that. Um, and all of that time, she never looked ill. I mean, I know these things vary hugely um, with, with people in, in the late stages of cancer. But she, all, all of that time, she simply looked like, like Polly. Like, and like a well Polly, but a tired Polly, um, who happened to be in a hospital bed with you know, drips going into her arms or whatever. It was only right at the very end, right in the last sort of 48 hours, that you could have said to look at her that this was, you know, this was coming towards the end. You know, right up until the last two or three days, you know, she, she just looked like herself. And we believe that actually all the incredible support, the healing that was sent to her, these incredible tune-ins that were happening every day from thousands of people across the world. We believe that made a huge difference. And also the wonderful supplements that we were recommended and the program that she was on energetically and nutritionally helped to maintain that and to keep that balance going for the time that it needed to do. And she was always clear that in some way she had called that challenge to herself. Um, and I've got here an amazing book of what she called her Earth Notes. She would have this thing that would happen to her. Sometimes she would wake up in the middle of the night with uh, a little download. Uh, and she would write that down. And then she would just go back to sleep. She wouldn't sit and sort of contemplate about it. And then sometimes she would come back to it. And always when she you know, came back to a particular page, it was always relevant. Had this ex she had this extraordinary kind of knack for synchronicity that just emerged in everything she did. 
I'm going to read a little piece that's actually from October 2015. What do you choose to experience? When you wish with all your heart, it is heard by the universe, and nothing less can come into being. Know this. You now have something far more valuable than you realise. You have all the means at your disposal to manifest whatever it is you wish to experience in this lifetime. Many others like you are ready. So go on, wish big and greatly, for in time, everyone who so chooses can and shall step into their highest being. Time is elastic. Much can happen in a moment, so let go of timelines. They only exist in a 3D universe. Yours is a 5D universe, where time and space have multi-continuous, are multi-continuous, uh, time and space have multi-continuums, sorry, that override lower dimensions and linear thinking. Speak and you shall be heard. Your voice carries your intent. So be clear in what you are for and what you call in. Small and large, they shall all be met. <laughs> and that to me is a great embodiment of, her, of Polly's attitude to life, the universe and everything. <laughs> um, the power of intent was always something that we worked very, very closely with and strongly with. And as anyone who, who knows Polly will know, her legal work always had a higher purpose and it always had a spiritual aspect to it. You know, not a, not a clo uh, sort of um, uh, conformist religion, what, religious one in any way, a very eclectic spirituality that Polly had um, and has. <laughs> um, but there was always that aspect to it. Um, and sometimes when people go so early, it's easy to feel regrets about, you know, what one maybe, what a shame they didn't get a chance to whatever that thing is, you know, and, and hoping that they didn't regret anything or, you know, did they, did they ever express the things they needed to express? I can honestly say that with Polly, I felt none of that. I felt like she had lived her purpose to such a fullness and to such an extent. To me, she didn't feel like she had any regrets. Um, and even in you know, the last couple of weeks with her last interactions with her family and so on, it was such a compassion, such a peace, such a reconciliation, um, and just yeah, an extraordinary grace um, with which that was all carried. And I believe that, that that is a product of having absolutely lived her truth, you know, 100% with everyone and in all situations. And I think there are very few people one can say that about. And I really feel that we can say that about Polly. And to come on to her work, you know, I believed when I first heard about her, um, and certainly, you know, when I first started working with her, you know, this is the biggest game in town. You know, when you encounter something that you realise the power of, that could actually change the whole direction of where we've been going on our planet. She used to describe it as a trim tab, which is that the little mechanism on a big ship that turns a small thing, but that turns the rudder, that then turns the ship. And making a crime of ecocide, an international crime of ecocide, has, has that power. Um, and that was something that um, absolutely, I, I felt deeply clearly ever since I, I heard about it. Um, and it wasn't something that was invented by Polly. Um, the concept of ecocide um, was talked about by Olaf Palme of Sweden back in the early 70s. It was even included in the original drafting of the Rome Statute, which is the governing document of the International Criminal Court. So we know it as including war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, crimes of aggression. But there was originally a crime of ecocide in there. And it was in the drafting and it was dropped at the last minute, courtesy of the UK, Netherlands and France. Um, so we have a lot to answer for in so many different ways, as I know <laughs> Gail's very conscious of as well. You know, this is where the Industrial Revolution started, and now it's where a new kind of revolution has been starting. Um, and so when, when Polly discovered this, you know, her, her question to herself was, you know, how do we create a le legal duty of care for the earth? And when she started researching it and realised that this was the case, she realised that actually that needed to be replaced into the Rome Statute. And it's not just to enable persons of superior responsibility to be held to account, the CEOs of polluting companies, 
um, government ministers who issue permit, permits for ecocidal activity. Um, that, of course, is, is the power of criminal law as opposed to civil law. In criminal law, an individual is responsible. And this is a huge distinction um, and one that sometimes um, people have found tricky to get their heads around. There's a lot of climate litigation going on across the world right now, and this is all wonderful. But the difference between civil litigation and criminal law is very simple. If someone beats you up in the street, you don't sue them. You go to the police, the police prosecutes, and it's that person that they prosecute. So it's about individuals, and it's about the state, or in the, the international criminal court, the international community, actually prosecuting an individual and, give, and giving them criminal responsibility. At the moment, corporations have the freedom to uh, commit, you know, to, to break civil regulation, um, and people can sue them, and it's expensive, and it's difficult, and it takes years, um, and maybe you'll get a few million in compensation. And of course, the corporations simply budgeted for that, and they will continue. But a criminal law is a very, very different game. It really is about the rules of the game of what's acceptable and what's not. Now, the fact that we have a crime of murder doesn't stop people being killed, but it stops it, sure as hell stops it being acceptable, and it stops you being able to build a business on it and get a government permit for it. Yeah? <laughs> so this is the real power of ecocide law. Yes, I know that there are probably a number of CEOs we'd like to see in the dock. You know, the, the, the fossil fuel companies, uh, pesticide companies, you know, they're, they're a raft waiting to happen. The real power of this is that, you see, the thing is with ecocide, it's a different kind of crime to all crimes of genocide. It is essentially a corporate crime. And of course, a lot of the biggest, most polluting corporations are sponsored by states. So it's actually both. Um, but it's essentially a crime of corporate behaviour. And it's not actually, at least I sincerely hope not, a crime of intent. You know, the CEOs of Shell didn't start out to destroy the Niger Delta. They didn't start out to be, you know, one of the top 10 carbon emissions polluters in the world. What they start out to do is to make a profit, to get oil and to sell energy. That's what they start out to do. The criminal activity happens along the way. The important thing is the knowledge. Okay, so it's not about, I, you know, I intended to do this. You can't get out of, of it by saying that. Um, it's about, you know, that this activity had the potential to cause or has caused serious damage, loss or destruction to ecosystems and you carried on anyway. And that is where the criminality lies. Um, and that is what is so powerful because actually, you know, regardless of who we put in the dock, if a government minister cannot issue a permit for an activity because that activity is illegal, then that activity cannot be legally done. Okay? And insurers cannot insure it. And investors cannot back it. So we are talking about a steer for business which has the power of nothing else. Yeah, it's absolutely key that people understand this. Okay? This is not just about trials. This is about shifting the entire raft of ecocidal activity that is currently legally permitted. Okay? So the power of this, I, think, I believe, cannot be underestimated. Um, it, it is the, the one realistic means to force a change of, in, uh, a change of industry direction into a healthy way. And let's not forget that when slavery was abolished, there was a huge outcry, or there was a huge outcry just before it happened with you know, hundreds of businesses saying, this is going to wreck the British Empire, this is going to completely trash our economy, we're not going to be able to do anything. They were given some time to change their practices, but not one single company went out of business. Business can work very fast when you tell it how. <laughs> let's remember that. So the other thing that's different, of course, about ecocide uh, crime, making a crime out of ecocide, is that what it does is it brings in the wider world. It brings in the planet that sustains us. And our crimes tend to be focused on people and what people do to each other. But it's about what we're also doing to the earth, to the planet, how we treat our mother, our home, our sustenance, really what enables us to survive, but also 
there's something here that for me really speaks to the, the changing of consciousness that Gail referred to. We need to start to realize that we're not separate. <laughs> you know, we belong of the, you know, we are of the earth. You know, we, 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 we she sustains us, earth sustains us. Um, but also, you know, we have a duty of care to give back to her. We don't own her. How can you own land? I mean, this is, you know, this is another huge question, of course. But um, we are part of her. Um, and what ecocide law shows is that we actually have to have a responsibility to the land, not just to each other, and that actually that those things actually are the same thing that this is actually a coming together. Um, and so there's, there's, to me, there's something very sort of both evolutionary and revolutionary in our current culture of making that acknowledgement. And for me, that perhaps is really the essence of what Polly embodied, this bringing together of people and planet. And that, that, that was ultimately her ultimate aim, was to bring this together and the unity of people and planet. And it's interesting that this year, her, her legal team, and I'll talk a little bit more about the wider team in a minute, are taking forward a test case, um, and it's based on the launch that we, that, uh, <clears throat> we arranged for The Hague in December, um, the launch of a preliminary examination into climate ecocide, where Polly actually named the CEOs of Shell, the global CEO Ben van Burden, the Netherlands CEO Marianne van Loon, as potential suspects in a crime of climate ecocide were that to be tabled, were that to exist, and to examine whether that would actually stand up as, um, as a crime and whether it would be prosecutable. What we're moving towards this year is testing it out under existing law. So at the moment, as you know, crimes against humanity is an international crime under the Rome Statute. And it has an article, it's Article 7.1K, and it, it covers other inhumane acts. And our legal team is now examining um, and putting together reports and creating a test case file to submit to, tr to, to test whether climate ecocide could be tried under crimes against humanity. Because, of course, the effect of the ecological ecocides, whether it's the tar sands, whether it's the Niger Delta, whether it's the emissions, you know, the direct ecocides, the, the climate-related ecocides that lead to actually um, illness, death, catastrophe for thousands, if not millions of people, and ultimately for all of us. And so whether this can be fit within existing law, we don't know for sure from a legal basis yet whether this can be done. If it can, my God, we have a tool with which to prosecute a whole raft of people. If it turns out that legally it cannot be, and yet we have all this extraordinary evidence that ecocide is an atrocity crime, we have a very clear remit then to say that there is missing law. So from the point of view of the investigations that we're doing, this is a win-win situation. And it's a very important one. And I feel like with what Polly's work has been working towards, what her team are now working on, but also this incredible time with the, climate, the growing climate activist movement, you know, we are looking at a wave. We're looking at a really a, a tidal wave coming here. Um, and working with Polly actually did feel like being on the crest of a wave. That's actually what it felt like. This ex there was, uh, there still is actually. I mean, uh, I mean, Ian and I have, have have been having conversations with her, you know, over the last few days since she parted, since she departed, and you know, she doesn't feel like she's gone anywhere in a way. She feels like she's gone everywhere rather than anywhere specific. Um, but you know, we feel like we've, we, you know, we've genuinely been been talking to her and working with her is like being on the, this crest of a wave, and and it's extraordinarily exciting because there's nobody to follow. You know, it, 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 we're having to move forward in, in a completely new way and we and, and work in a completely new way. And that's extraordinarily exciting. But it's also amazingly supported because as you know, if you're on the crest of a wave, you have this whole wave beneath you 
there's this extraordinary feeling of energy. Um, and as Gail said, I think we're in this incredible moment. We're in this moment of great turning. But Polly had the, the delight, and it really was delight, to, to witness when she saw what was happening in London and she saw these little videos of what happened at Shell, there was even a bit of graffiti that said, for Polly, with a, with a heart, and it tickled her pink and she wanted to watch it again and again. And, and, she was, and she was so excited about it. And she just said, Jojo, it's all falling into place. You know, it's all happening. It's all going to land, you know, and, and it was just this extraordinary sense of achievement, actually, um, uh, but also of recognition that this was the moment. You know, this is, it's like the, the, this huge wave of activism that's literally sweeping the globe right now um, is all about waking up. You know, Greta's call to awakening, Extinction Rebellion's call to awakening, and it feels like ecocide law is just the next step. It's like, okay, we can now see this. We can see that this is an emergency, an emergent situation. And ecocide law is the next step of what can we do. And Polly was always a doer. And I love that about her. You know, it was always, you know, working with Polly was working at 100 miles an hour. It's like being let off the leash. It was unbelievable. Um, and there's so much energy behind this. It's our energy, it's your energy, but I feel also it is the energy of spirit. The number of miraculous synchronicities that have occurred over the course of my work with Polly, over the course of her whole campaign over the last decade, has been incredible. There's been such a sense that the universe has been waiting for this to happen, wants it to happen, and is carrying us all forward. And it's just an extraordinary sense of um, timeliness. An extraordinary time and Polly's extraordinary timing. I mean, just incredible. And really, the, what I want to kind of move towards is, is just this sense that she is passing us all the baton. She really is. This is, oh my God, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. Um, this is about all of us carrying forward what she was the torchbearer for, you know. Um, and in practical terms, that means her team, and there are many of us. I'm not going to be able to remember all their names now, so <laughs> I'm not going to try to do that. But in the next um, communications that you'll have from us, we, we will be you know, explaining who we are and adding a page to the website and so on. Um, but the legal baton is being taken by a new director of our non-profit, um, who's called Fidel Camarillo Pazimino. He's a fantastically experienced criminal lawyer in his own right. He headed up the Serious Crime Unit in Ecuador um, and was phenomenal at um, dealing with the corrupt system that had previously been there and sadly seems to have returned. Um, but he is based in Madrid at the, um, at the office of Balthazar Garçon, who some of you may have heard of, who's a really big name in, corpor in um, investigating corporate and state crime. Um, and he was the one who had General Pinochet arrested at the late, in the late 90s. Um, that may ring some bells. But uh, Fidel is, is working from his office, um, and, he, and it is his legal research and legal work that will, be taking, that will be taking the lead with this test prosecution case, and we're in fantastic hands with that. Um, but there's a whole team around him, and there's also a team around the wider campaign. Um, and again, with this extraordinary timing, I would say that probably until the last two or three months, if Polly hadn't been there, it would have been very, very difficult. But now, with everything that's happening and with the team we have around us, we actually can carry this forward. Um, and so it's, it's actually extraordinary in a sense that with, you know, 10 years and more of work, you know, she's, I mean, there are so many times that like Gail, she has felt like a complete voice in the wilderness. You know, where people haven't listened, where big NGOs have not wanted to come on board. It's too risky. It's too controversial. You know, someone even said to her, oh, I can't touch this, Polly. It's too big. And her internal response was, well, I better go back to my bedroom and carry on then. You know, um, it's, it's, there are times when it's been really difficult, when she's really felt that this, my God, is this really going to happen? There have been moments like that. Um, but now we're in a position where not only is the, you know, the time ready for it, but we have the team ready for it too. 
Um, and so that's really deeply encouraging. Um, and we had this amazing meeting, actually. In fact, the only work meeting work, and I mean work in the really in the greater sense, not in the nine to five sense, because for Polly, it was all that. Um, but the only sort of work meeting, if you like, that we had since she became ill was actually with um, Simon, with Gail's partner, um, where we were talking about what was about to happen in the rebellion and what, you know, what, what, um, you know, how this all played in and that they really, you know, that, that Extinction Rebellion was so wanting to support uh, our, our Ecoside Law campaign. And we knew that we needed a rebrand uh, this year, that we were going to need to reframe ourselves and make it much simpler, much punchier, much clearer and easier to understand what we were doing. And we kind of looked at each other at the end of that meeting and we said, we're going to, you know, we're going to need to do this before the rebellion, aren't we? And bear in mind, this is two weeks before the rebellion. <laughs> um, and, you know, and Polly said, yeah, absolutely. This has got to be done in the next two weeks. And I have to say, Frank, it was the busiest two weeks of my life. You know, um, it was being with Polly every day for some time. It was holding the campaign um, in her absence. It was managing her communications in her absence. But it was also managing a complete rebrand and a totally new website in two weeks. And we just made it. We just made it. It's still a work in progress, but it's there. The messaging is there. There are flyers. There are placards. There are things you can download. You know, they're, they're, any minute now, there's going to be publicly available T-shirts. You know, it, it's, it's all present. Um, and it's in a way that it's never been before and in a way that's shareable in a way that it's never been before. And one of the things that Polly said, and she was always such a pragmatist. It was brilliant. Um, <laughs> When, when we sent out that first email about when she was ill, and she, she was so clear that she wanted to explain the, you know, how drastic it all was, invite people's responses. And when I was sending out these emails, um, our, our first thought was to let the immediate community know, which in our case is actually a few hundred people, whoever we would normally have on our party list. Um, and at the last moment, and it was in the middle of the night, I just thought, do you know what? I'm just going to put George Monbiot on that list. Um, now, George has always been very, very supportive, but he's a very busy man and normally takes three to four weeks to answer an email. By the morning, I had a response saying, I've been wanting to do a piece on Polly for ages. It must happen now. And when I told Polly, she said, that's the best news yet. <laughs> you know, and this, he, he brought out this incredible article and that really started the campaign to move. Um, and then with all the action of e Extinction Rebellion and the climate movements over the last couple of weeks, we, and, and of course with the ultimate shock and moment of Polly actually passing on Easter Day, it's had an extraordinary effect on the campaign. And I know, I, I can tell you right now, she's, she's, there, she's laughing and she's happy. And she, she actually, and Ian will testify to this, she passed with a little mischievous smile on her face that was so unusual. And, you know, the nurses all remarked on it. They said, you don't often see something like that. You know, and... And you know, there was such a sense in that tune in on the Sunday evening, uh, just literally less than an hour after she'd gone, there was such a sense, and I was sitting there with tears streaming down my face, feeling such an extraordinary sense of lightness and joy. Um, and this sense that she was no longer constrained by time and space, <laughs> but that she was everywhere and she was with us. It was the most extraordinary feeling. Um, and she said, to, to George Monbiot, she said, what I would love to live to see, and wasn't quite, didn't quite have long enough for that, is a million Earth Protectors. Uh, you know, for that Earth Protector campaign to grow and grow and grow. We founded that campaign together as Mission Life Force at the end of 2017, and it's now under the slogan, Stop Ecos, I Change the Law. But it's still the same movement of Earth Protectors, and it's still based on this same trust fund. Um, and Gail touched a little bit on what the trust fund can be used for, what the document can be used for by activists um, as primary evidence in court that the action that's been taken, the non-violent direct action that's been taken, has been taken from a moral position, from a position of conscience, as a conscientious protector, that was another one of her downloads, um, as a conscientious protector and not as a criminal. In, all, in other words, to protect from harm, not to cause it. Um, so all of that is still there. Um, and, of course, you know, if there's one ask that I think she would potentially have left us with, it's let's all be Earth Protectors. Let's have everybody be Earth Protectors. Because I think in our hearts, we already are. Yeah, absolutely.
Um, and, you know, the healing miracle in the physical sense may not have taken place. But I, I know I witnessed healing miracles on a number of levels happening over the last few weeks, inner and outer in the world. And I believe that miracle absolutely did happen and is with us and carrying us forward. And I'd like to just finish with another of her earth notes. Um, and it, this one's from 2016. And it's from April, actually. So this time three years ago. And it's called Heaven in Earth. Choosing to experience heaven in earth can happen not only with this lifetime, but also in many others. And for many others, should you so choose. Or it can be the journey that matters. Or it can be both. Or not. Always, it comes down to choice. What makes it a simple choice in the wider scheme of things, in service to something, is makes it a simple choice in the, in, the wider, is the, in the wider scheme of things, in service to something greater than the self, is whether it's for the best. If it's for the best, and that's the route you choose, treat whatever happens next as your doorway to take. Letting go of the consequence allows the emergence of something far greater, exceeding any sense of what that might be. Trust in the unknown and know that there is greater purpose behind everything that happens. The more you can step into the unknown without fear, the more what you experience becomes shaped by your intent. Each time you feel fear rising, let it. That way your fears can be released. And then you have space for trust and fearlessness, which brings you closer to heaven in earth. Thank you. It's extraordinary, Jojo, and a huge thank you to...